Thank you all for coming and welcome to the ARMA Annual Lecture for 2018. I'm Sue Brown and I'm the Chief Executive of ARMA, the Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Alliance. Our Chair, uh, Professor Anthony Wolf, sent his apologies. He is giving all because they're five hours ahead of us, has just given the keynote speech at the Conference of the Arthritis Alliance in Canada, uh, but he would otherwise have loved to be here. Um, one thing I should say before we start is that sitting still for an hour is really not very good for your muscles. <laughs> so if anybody feels the need to stand up, stretch, move around, then please feel free to do that throughout the course of the evening. Um, you will notice that we are filming the event, and this means that we can put uh, a recording of the event on YouTube for anyone who couldn't be here tonight, who would like to see it. If there is anyone during the questions who would rather not appear in the film, then let us know, because we will be editing the film before we post it. Just to very briefly say a little bit about Armour, for anyone who doesn't know us, I think most people probably do. So we are the umbrella body representing the whole breadth of musculoskeletal conditions and the professions that work in the musculoskeletal field. And our vision is that the musculoskeletal health of the population is promoted throughout life and that everyone with a musculoskeletal condition receives appropriate, high quality interventions to promote their health and well-being in a timely manner. And of course that will include support of physical activity, which is the subject of tonight's lecture. Um, Armour is totally dependent on our members, and we could not do what we do without them, of course, as an umbrella body. And we are very grateful to Versus Arthritis for their support in tonight's lecture. So I'm going to invite Liam O'Toole, the Chief Executive of Versus Arthritis, to say a few words. Thank you, Sue. Um, it's wonderful to see so many familiar faces, but what's even more wonderful is to see so many new faces here tonight. Now, Versus Arthritis, we're delighted to be sponsoring this year's uh, annual Armour Lecture. And Versus Arthritis is all about demanding more for people with arthritis and empowering people with arthritis to demand more for themselves. And we will not stop until we have a society that doesn't dismiss, uh, trivialise and ignore the pain, fatigue and isolation of arthritis in all its forms. About versus arthritis, we're also passionate about um, exercise and physical activity. And like all our colleagues in Armour, we want to get the message across that actually being active is good for bones, joints and muscles for, and for your health. Um, and that's something we all share. I want, I want to get on to the lectures, but I wanted to leave you with three points. First, it's important to recognise that being active means different things to different people. Um, not everybody uh, likes the same thing. We all have activities we like and we don't like. For me, it's tennis that I do, but one size doesn't fit all. Tonight, we're celebrating the wonderful park run, which has get, getting so many people active, but also is wonderfully accessible to people of all abilities. Um, at Versus Arthritis, we are um, rolling out escape knee pain with partners, but we're also looking at, uh, a part, we've, we've been piloting in Scotland a walking with ease programme, and all of the armour colleagues in here have different models of activity that we put out, and the important thing is that we get people moving and uh, that there's a choice. So that's the first thing. The second thought is that we, what we do know is that pain stops people from being active. So at Versus Arthritis, we're constantly listening to people with arthritis with all types of musculoskeletal conditions, and all too often we hear people saying that my pain is a message to me not to be active. And, and more worrying, we hear people saying that they're being advised not to be active. And we've also got lots of cases of people 
being offered inappropriate exercise, physical activity interventions and, and activities that don't take into account the pain and fatigue of, of arthritis. So there's, a, there's, a, there's quite a lot of myth-busting that together we need to do. And the final thought is not only do we want to get people moving uh, more, but we also want to get people talking about arthritis more. Um, uh, or for too long, arthritis has been diminished, ignored, and not recognised. And what we're asking people to do is to talk about it more. Just get a conversation going. You will know one in six people with some form of musculoskeletal disease. You will know somebody with pain, fatigue, and isolation. Chances are they're hiding it. So start that national conversation. Maybe at the end of your next park run, you turn to the next the person next to you and talk to them about their arthritis and their pain and let's get that conversation going and let's get arthritis awareness out there. So thank you and I look forward to a, a, a really interesting evening. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Um, I think that was a very good introduction to uh, this evening, uh, particularly because uh, we are talking to Park Run about whether there is something that we can do in partnership with them um, as ARMA and as ARMA members to really emphasise uh, the benefits of physical activity for musculoskeletal health. Uh, so maybe we will be encouraging people to talk about arthritis at the end of their Park Run. Um, Physical activity is a subject that is of interest to a lot of, if not all, ARMA members one way and another. It's really important to our membership and that's why we're here this evening with this topic. There's a general consensus that of the benefits to musculoskeletal health, the benefits of physical activity to helping people to manage their musculoskeletal conditions. But we also know quarter of adults are inactive. People with long-term conditions are twice as likely to be inactive as other people. And we are 20% less active than we were in the 1960s. So somewhere along the lines, we're either not doing the right things, we in this room are not doing the right things, or we're not doing enough of the right things to counteract the things that are driving things in the wrong direction. <coughs> and that's really what we want to talk about this evening. We're going to have three speakers with three slightly different perspectives on this. Uh, Michael Brannan, Brannan, who is the Physical Activity Manager of Public Health England. Claire Harris, who is a physiotherapist and is part of the NAS exercise programme. And Nick Pearson, who is the Chief Executive of Park Run. They're each going to speak briefly, then we'll have a, a little discussion and then I will invite questions from the audience. Uh, when we finish the lecture, uh, please do feel free to go back next door and continue the discussions over a glass of wine if you wish. And uh, we would encourage you, if you want, to, and if you are active on Twitter, to tweet about this evening, either during or after the event, using the hashtag MSKActivity. But now I'd like to invite Michael Brannan to open. Uh, thank you very much. I'm uh, very pleased to be here and uh, I think it's actually a very timely session given that the physical activity guidelines are being reviewed at the moment and are going to be, Chief Medical Officers will publish them next year. And in particular, we're quite pleased that they, it will pro provide an opportunity to have a refocus, particularly on the, in terms of the musculoskeletal and strengthening elements of the guidelines. Um, so in terms of musculoskeletal health, uh, we know that there's a range of, range of factors. So um, there's a range of physiological factors and then they have an impact in terms of functional factors. And we also know what are the, uh, the risk factors for these aspects. So uh, genetics, diet, obesity and physical inactivity. So in terms of physical activity, one of the things is Actually, the guidelines themselves are three elements. One is about the cardiovascular element of physical activity. One is about strengthening and balance and coordination. And the other is about reducing sedentary time. So a lot of, there's a lot of focus and, and, it, and it's great to see it on the cardiovascular element for 150 minutes for, for adults. But there's, the other bits are often referred to as forgotten guidelines. And that's one of the bits that I'd like to really discuss today. 
So we recognised that the muscle strengthening and balance activity elements were, for, as, as people have described, the forgotten guidelines. So with the Centre for Aging Better, we actually commissioned a review of these elements of the guidelines and to identify actually what specific health benefits do people gain from achieving the strength and balance and coordination elements. And one of the aspects of this was to influence the, the new Chief Medical Officer's guidelines. And the findings of those uh, reviews are actually uh, being inputted into the guidelines and will influence what, what comes out next year. So um, they were published in a range of papers and we've also published a summary of the report. But this is one of the, the, key, uh, the key diagrams and it shows that uh, you can see the two lines. One of them is, the top one is in terms of people who are, being, who are active and doing strengthening activities over their life, their life course. And in the below is the ones whose strengthening isn't necessarily part of their, of their routine. And you can see that actually what the benefit of doing uh, strengthening activities is it maintains that function and, and, pre and prevents you falling into, into disability. And one of the other key things to take from this diagram is those key life course events, which are where we know that people can, can fall out of doing physical activity and fall out of doing strengthening activities, such as uh, pregnancy, obviously diagnosis of, of disease or significant disease events or hospitalisation, which people with MSK uh, issues cover, and also, and also falls. And so it highlights that it's actually particularly important for people who suffer these or come into contact with these uh, life course events, that they support it to even maintain or start to build up their physical activity. So, uh, as I mentioned, you know, they're referred to as, as forgotten elements of the guidelines. And we know, you know, around uh, two thirds of adults, of, of males, and around half of females achieve the cardiovascular elements of the guidelines. But we know, as this evidence shows, in terms of on the left is the, the, those achieving the strengthening. And on the right is those achieving the balance and coordination guidelines. And we know that actually the numbers or the proportion achieving this is actually much lower. And so it is something that we need to specifically focus on. So in terms of the benefits, you know, we know uh, this, uh, there was another paper looking at the risks and benefits of doing uh, strength and balance activities. And it shows, as you can see, you know, in terms of uh, falls, uh, positive impact on falls risk factors and also reducing falls risks. But also there's obviously other evidence about for people with uh, musculoskeletal issues in terms of improving functioning, uh, reducing deterioration of your, of your condition and also the risk of having to have quite significant interventions such as arthroplasty or uh, hip replacement. So one of the other things I thought would be useful to highlight is actually the potential for, uh, for cost saving to the NHS. Obviously, you know, cost and saving is a, is a big focus of, of uh, any, any investment these days. And so uh, PHG commissioned a return on investment um, assessment of seven interventions which had an evidence base um, on uh, MSK. So, and what it showed was for four interventions, and it, and it was about, you know, what's the return for one pound invested? Uh, and there was, there was showed there was strong evidence for four of the interventions, and it returned, uh, returned between five and over 200 pounds per pound invested in, for people with MSK issues. So it shows that actually these interventions can uh, work, and they can work for the patient, and they can also work for the health system. So we need to actually invest in these and scale them up. So, in summary, because we've only got a uh, short space of time, um, you know, it's, it's important that we, uh, we consider the important of, importance of physical activity, uh, particularly strengthening activities across the life course. So, as that graph shows, it's particularly important early in, the, early in life as well as as you get older. And so, the potential for, for uh, musculoskeletal health is in terms of prevention of MSK conditions, improving management of conditions, and that includes pain. As, we were, we were discussing earlier, and also in terms of improving quality of life through maintaining and improving function. And also, which I haven't put on here, reducing the risk of co comorbidities, because we know particularly in terms of mental health for people who, who suffer MSK issues, it's a huge issue. As I referred to earlier, it's about uh, recognising that the specific transition points that's important we keep, in, uh, we keep in mind when we think about supporting people to be more physically active. active. 
And also something that we haven't had time to talk about is the importance of uh, embedded physical activity in terms of public health tiered approach to improving musculoskeletal health. And also that it can provide, as I mentioned, a positive financial return on investment. So also I wouldn't be giving a PhD presentation without highlighting some of the, uh, some of the resources that are available and particularly you know, uh, ones we've done with, colleague, with colleagues here. And I noticed, I'm sure Benjamin will be doing a, a signing of uh, his cartoon <laughs> interventions. I saw some copies out there. Uh, and also, so there's the evidence stuff, there's the clinical resources in particular. I know Arma members supported the Moving Medicine resource and there's a, there's a focus on MSK resources for clinicians in there, and the, uh, the new um, infographic for, for disabled adults, and also the, the data resources. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, that was a really good kind of top-level um, overview of physical activity. Uh, we're now going to hear from Claire, who I think is probably going to bring it right back down to a patient level based on her experiences. Thank you. And I would like to, like to say uh, thank you very much to Sue and to Arma um, for asking me uh, to come and present uh, and take part in uh, tonight's event. I uh, really am very pleased to be here, so thank you very much. Um, so really just very briefly, because we haven't just been given a, a short slot, um, I just want to go through what sort of barriers do people with musculoskeletal conditions have to engaging in physical activity and just give you some highlights of how they can uh, be overcome. So whether or not we've got a musculoskeletal condition or not, we all have barriers to exercise and the most common one that people come up with is time. Uh, so uh, also fatigue, lack of, lack of motivation, poor self-esteem, they're worried about what they look like, perhaps there's poor family support, financial problems, um, lack of transport. We've all probably arrived today either on a bus or a train, it's really, really easy, but if you live out in a rural community, um, you know, maybe it's just a bus once a day, uh, and that's not much good to get you to the gym. So I think we do need to think about some general barriers. I also want to just think about some specific barriers. So my background is very much uh, axial spar or ankylosing spondylitis. Um, and this is, but obviously the barriers that I'm uh, stating here um, very much fit into, um, I think, probably all inflammatory, background, inflammatory arthritis backgrounds. Um, and there was a nice um, paper from uh, Norway, I think, uh, and they, looked at, uh, they stated that AS patients were significantly more likely to report barriers to being physically uh, active compared with controls. So that's 78% versus 58. I think that's really quite stark. And the main barrier that they quoted was pain. So 48% of the AS patients said that pain was their main barrier to activity and exercise. Stiffness came in at 36%. Fatigue 30 and disability 21. So those were their four main barriers. But I think also there are other barriers that we need to be concerned about when we're wanting our patients to get physically active. They're frightened that they're going to start or trigger a flare. They're worried about their existing postural changes, perhaps that might be what they look like, or how they're going to manage a piece of equipment. They're worried about their comorbidities, perhaps they may have um, osteoporosis. They're worried about fractures and is also worried um, about balance. So how can they be overcome? I think it's really important that we have a discussion with our patients um, about the barriers. Some may be very real barriers and others may be perceived, but if we can have a conversation and a discussion with our patients uh, and try and talk them through and try and find ways, be it over, around or breaking down those barriers. Perhaps it may be helpful to use example of patients who benefit from exercise and how they've managed. We're asking our patients to change their behaviour and motivational interviewing um, has been proven uh, very helpful uh, in behaviour change, so that might be something uh, to think about. Moving medicine, um, which Mike very briefly mentioned, um, is a great website um, and especially for um, clinicians that perhaps aren't used to discussing exercise, uh, it has, um, you can choose your condition, so it has um, arthritis, 
And then it says, do you have one minute, do you have five minutes, or do you have more minutes to talk with your patient? And it gives you some ideas about how you can bring in the topic of exercise and physical activity. And there's a very nice um, patient uh, leaflet that you can print out as well. I think you need to be positive about exercise. Uh, you know, you're never going to sell it to your patients unless you're really positive about it. And it may be appropriate to, as well uh, for you and your patient to set some SMART goals. So these need to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-based. Perhaps your patients also might want to know the evidence behind what you're saying. So since July 2011, we've had our UK Chief Medical Officer guidance, um, and there's a really nice infographic there that you can have up on your desktop or you can print out and just go through that uh, with your patient. As far as um, Axel Spar goes, we've had the nice recommendations since uh, February 2017 that promote um, physiotherapy, promote exercise, uh, and also say that hydrotherapy is a useful adjunct, and I think that's really important that we get hydrotherapy out there, especially uh, for our patients with inflammatory arthritis. EULA have come out with their recommendations uh, only this year, and I just want you to highlight um, just one part of their recommendation. But the planning of physical activity requires a shared decision between healthcare providers and people with rheumatoid arthritis, spondyloarthropathy, hand OA or knee OA, which takes people's preferences, capabilities and resources into account. And I think that's really important. But if we want to engage with our patients, we want to get them onto our side, we have to really take all those things um, into account. So physiotherapists, I feel, are really in a great place um, to do this. They have the knowledge, they have the opportunity. They've got the medical background to know about the conditions. They also come from um, a physical background as well. So we can assess the patient, patients, which we do on a regular basis. And by assessing our patient, we may come up with the fact that they've got a stiff knee or a painful knee, or they've got reduced um, range of movement in their neck. So we can really hone in on something to treat and to give them exercises on. And we can show the patients, perhaps um, if we take annual assessments, you know, perhaps where their posture may have deteriorated. So hopefully that will motivate a patient that they can see the deterioration in black and white, whether or not they feel it or not. Um, and we can then talk about where uh, the best place is for them to do their exercises. Do they want to do them at home? Do they want to do them in the hospital? Do they want to go to the gym? And then what sort of exercise and the dose. And throughout all that, we're going to be thinking of the safety of the patient. Because um, you're absolutely right, the fact that you know, we do have to take into account comorbidities, um, is there a fracture risk, do they have problems with their balance? And then as a physio, we also do on ongoing monitoring, uh, which again I think helps to the adherence side of things. If patients know they're coming back, they know they're going to be remeasured, we can look at how they're doing their exercises and perhaps just correct if necessary. Um, and uh, hopefully um, just re-motivate them if required. I think it's important to be able to signpost um, general activities, and I think a way into getting your patient uh, to do specific exercises um, is to start off with something that they like. Uh, there are greater apps out there, Couch to 5K, uh, Active 10. Uh, council websites are also a really great place uh, to look for activities, walking football, walking netball, um, all sorts of activities, a dance class, yoga, pilates, tai chi, whatever it might be. Also the nhs.uk uh, website, if you look up the living well section, again, lots of great um, exercise videos. So have a look, there's lots of resources out there that you can signpost your patients to. Wearable monitors, lots of patients now have some smart watches, um, and again, a really um, great way of um, getting your patient to exercise. And the CSP um, <coughs> has a really good campaign at the moment, Love Activity, Hate Exercise. Uh, and they've got some great resources, um, and they have a, a section specifically for patients with arthritis, so I would um, suggest that you really have a good look at that. And then finally, uh, NAS, um, it's you know, their own website, uh, which has just been redone. Uh, do take a look if you haven't looked at it recently. 
has such good information um, for patients uh, on exercise. They have over 90 branches, which give, for the most part, weekly access uh, to a physiotherapist. And for some lucky ones, they also get weekly hydrotherapy. There's the Back to Action app, which is free to download, but which is specifically designed to help patients um, go to the gym and to exercise safely in the gym. There's a DVD that patients might want to use at home if they don't fancy going to the gym. Um, it's got chair exercises, but it's also got exercises if a patient's had a hip replacement and is concerned about exercising after a hip replacement. There's also specific um, apps uh, for spondyloarthropathy and MySpa, which was um, developed uh, in association with Whips Cross Hospital, has a great exercise library, and then there are lots of um, exercise uh, videos via the NAS website and their YouTube. Um, so there's lots out there. So there's no excuse that you can direct your patient in the right place uh, and hopefully motivate them to exercise. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, earlier this year, I saw a tweet, as you do, about public health that I thought was really interesting. I thought, I wonder who that is. Um, it turned out it was Nick Pearson, the chief executive of Park Run, and that is where the relationship between Arma and Park Run started. Um, so I'd now like to invite Nick to give his perspective on this topic. Thank you. Hello. Uh, good evening, everyone, and thanks so much for inviting me, Sue. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have the opportunity to share some of my personal thoughts with you and to be in such esteemed company. Clearly, we're all here this evening, every single one of us, because we share a mutual desire to improve health. The vast majority of us, in fact, if not all of us, believe that increasing physical activity has a positive role to play in supporting that objective. All evidence points to a positive association between physical activity and positive health outcomes. Yet as a broad population, despite hundreds of millions of pounds worth of investment, we're struggling to make any significant impact on the activity levels of the nation. Of course, this is frustrating. Even more so when we look at the disproportionate distribution of this inactivity and its over-indexing in low socio-economic groups. Whilst logically this is no surprise at all, the significance of this is that many of the populations most at risk from life impacting health conditions are the, mo are the populations most likely to be inactive, doubling down on their risk levels and potentially creating a health underclass. A population exposed to the highest environmental and social risk factors, cut adrift and deprived of the vast majority of health initiatives and interventions. Park Run, however, has been able to cut some, through some of these structural, political, environmental and social challenges and deliver interventions that are making an impact. Last weekend, 291,400 different people ran, jogged, walked or volunteered a uh, park run event in 20 countries around the world. In the UK, at 826 different locations, the inclusivity and accessibility of park run events meant that we saw over 8,000 different people take part that were classified as inactive when they registered for park run. We saw around 2,500 people take part over the age of 70. We saw over 14,000 people that came from low socio-economic communities, and we saw over 10,000 take part with a disability or long-term health condition, of which around a quarter of those were people with musculoskeletal conditions. And of course, as you know, all of this happens every single week. So whilst there are enormous challenges in stimulating behaviour change and encouraging higher activity levels, it's not impossible. So as a society, 
Where have we got it wrong? What can we do better? Firstly, I would say, medical professionals have been slow in acknowledging the role and benefit of physical activity as a preventative or com complementary measure. Happily, this is changing, and changing quite quickly. The Health Secretary has been a very vocal advocate of preventative health measures, and the partnership between Park Run and the Royal College of GPs has been a huge step forward in formalising and validating the medical profession's position that physical activity supports good health. However, we still see major pockets of resistance, and there is definitely more that can be done formally and at a national level to develop a cultural acceptance of positively encouraging movement to support <coughs> health. And on that point, we've failed miserably over a generation in communicating physical activity as a palatable, consumable option for vast waves of the UK population. Frustratingly, despite the physical activity options available only appealing to a certain segment of the population, rather than find the right option, we've offered more of the same options, and justified their failure in language that often blames people for being lazy or irresponsible. The fact is that for a significant section of the population, the no pain, no gain approach is intimidating and inaccessible. Formal, organised, traditional physical activity doesn't fit with their lifestyles, doesn't address their anxieties and emotional stresses, it doesn't represent any kind of realistic choice or seem remotely achievable. But here too we are making progress. The recently released This Gold Can campaign directly challenges this. And actually, the whole This Gold Can campaign has been hugely significant in starting a totally new narrative about validating who can do physical activity and what counts as physical activity. In reality, moving more counts. It's relative and it's personal. We need be, to be better at encouraging people to start, to start on their terms. Physical activity counts no matter where, no matter how long. In my opinion, we've failed to present a credible entry route into physical activity by setting the entry standard too high. Doing anything is better than doing nothing. Intensity levels have largely no impact on health outcomes, yet we've allowed an inactive population to believe that it hurts, it takes a long time, it's expensive, and you get judged by other people. Still, the number one reason people don't do park run is that they feel they're not fit enough. Not believing they can do it is the endemic problem we need to address. It's almost always entirely false, but for a generation we've made it worse, not better. And briefly, I'd like to just touch on the issue of language, blame and personal responsibility. Clearly, reminding people who don't think they can exercise that they should is not working. It fuels the Daily Mail-style blame culture. Talk of taking personal responsibility while making perfect logical sense is just not addressing the issue of perceived competence, perceived fitness, or availability of achievable activity options. We need to work harder to empathise, to understand, to encourage, to celebrate, and to avoid being patronising. The challenge is helping people believe that they can, <coughs> not to believe that they should. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nick, um, and hopefully that's uh, going to get the discussion off to a good start. Um, I just wanted to uh, briefly uh, invite the other two speakers to respond uh, to that, maybe to that final challenge, which is uh, to what extent can, let's start with Public Health England, help to deliver that, helping people to believe they can and not that they should. Oh, yes. um, I think that's the basis of uh, 
of our approach to social marketing. So, you know, um, so in terms of uh, for children, but also for adults in terms of One You. And they've been specifically developed with the target audience of people who, uh, who are from lower socioeconomic groups, who, uh, who, who do have health issues. And it's trying to, uh, as you say, it's about presenting, uh, presenting the opportunities in language that, that relates to them and that they can understand and providing the, the resources and the opportunities to, to actually start to get more active. And so that's why providing a range of different uh, different opportunities, linking them to, to local opportunities, but in, for example, for um, for physical activity for for adults in terms of from for uh, the active ten for people to start walking for the, for the cash to five k for people who want to start to start running, and so we need we need a range of options for people and a, and a continuum for people to to get more physically active, and that's what what we're trying to do. Thank you. And Claire, to what extent do you think that physios, obviously not you, but some physios, are maybe guilty of the should as opposed to the you can? I'd like to think they're not. <laughs> um, I mean, I think, you know, the, the CSP campaign at the moment that they're running, um, love activity, hate exercise, um, I think hopefully is really going to steer conversations um, and guide physios if they need it. Um, I hope that they don't. I think physios are fairly practically orientated. I think um, that for most of us, you know, when we see patients, I mean, gone are the days I'm hoping that you get a sheet of 20 exercises and told to go away uh, and do them. Um, you know, I, if I can possibly help it, never give a patient more than three exercises, uh, and I try and make it as practical as possible. And I think the way to get patients to exercise is to do, encourage any physical activity that they may enjoy. Um, and I think that's really important to, to stress that, that, you know, a way into formal exercise is via being active and increasing their activity levels, um, be it walking the dog, be it gardening, um, be it dancing, you know, and I think it's about physios saying, not being um, dictatorial, not saying, you know, you must do Pilates or you must do um, Tai Chi, or whatever it is. I think we need to get patients to choose something they like. I think we need to explain to patients that just because they've tried it once and they didn't like it, you know, is it actually that they didn't like Tai Chi or is it the fact that it was the class they didn't like, maybe it was the instructor, maybe it was the time of day that the class was, all sorts of things that we just need to um, be thinking about and having discussions with our patients uh, so that we can try and encourage them to be active and I'm all for my patients being active, doing something they enjoy because then they're more likely to see the merit of actually doing some specific exercises as well. Thank you. And Nick, I want I wanted to ask you, one of the challenges that is talked about a lot in the NHS is spread. And and I've had several conversations this evening with people here who are interested in escape pain, which is well known to work. And I want to know why does that not exist everywhere? Because it's so obvious. The one thing that Parkrun does not seem to have a problem with is spread. Um, why do you think that is? Is there anything you think the NHS could learn? And is there any way that Park Run could help the spread of other types of activity, so swimming or cycling, or people for whom walking and running is not is not right? You well, yeah. Do you, do you need my microphone? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that the I think we get some things right. We're definitely not the answer to everybody and everything. I mean, I think everybody is absolutely clear there isn't one single solution. Um, and so, you know, as I pointed out, we're we're still considered inaccessible, inaccessible to a large population of um, uh, of the inactive population. So, um, I think that the the things that we've been quite good at are evolving and understanding where we've been successful. So we started off as, a, as, a, as actually a competitive running event and quite quickly learnt and understood 
that we were becoming an access point to physical activity and kind of modified and changed and adapted as a result of that. We started from day one in a, because of the founders' philosophy and uh, ethical values, we started with a um, egalitarian position where everybody was equal regardless of uh, speed, finishing position, competence, um, and, and, and that's been a massive part of, um, of encouraging people through that, that entry point and that access point. So being quite different, so rather than ranking people based upon their, their sporting or physical activity, but treating everybody in an egalitarian way, um, has, has been a really significant part in being able to, to build the success. Um, so, yes, I think we can play a part in supporting um, in a, a, other activities that do similar things. I think that the answer to, um, to the physical activity challenge is for there to be more local, community-delivered, physically accessible, scalable solutions that are invested in by public uh, by public finances um, and I think that our model demonstrates what's possible <coughs> but you in a in an ideal future you should be able to within your community for free choose between four, five, six different options over the course of a week um, um, around what you can do that's free that's delivered by volunteers that's community and social in nature um, and I think that yeah we can share a model that shows how that can be done at relatively low cost. Great, thank you very much. Does anybody have a question? We don't need roving mics because you all have your own microphone but you will need to turn it on before speaking. Does anybody have a question? Yeah. So I'll give uh, for your point first Claire, it's time which I think is one of the major barriers but I never hear a patient tell me they never have time for Netflix. <laughs> so I think, I think the biggest challenge we have is to realise who our competitors are in the MSK space. Our competitors are not other charities, they're not other private physios, they're not other NHS prime, uh, uh, practices. Our competitors are television and tacos, countdown and cookies, and Netflix and Mandos. They're our <coughs> competitors because people will still find time to do that because it's tapped into an internal subconscious drive because these are behaviours we want to enact upon. How do we as a community find a way to tap into Candy Crush, to Pokemon Go, to Angry Birds, to actually want people to enact in these behaviours so that do them naturally? If we can achieve that, then time won't be the barrier. So my question is, how do we mimic the, behavior, the activities and behaviours of successful businesses that find a way to manipulate people's time and focus and dedication to give those bite-sized pieces of time every day, every week, to dedicate it to do a healthy of behaviours? I think, to a certain extent, things like Fitbits have helped uh, that, because for some people that really motivates people, they're able to be part of a, a group, um, be it a family group or a social group, um, and compete amongst each others. Um, and they also can, I understand for some of them, get goals and set them and, and get rewards and things. So maybe that's um, something I think that can help um, on the Candy Crush idea theme, maybe. Um, I think perhaps there, there's definitely a hole in the market somewhere for something, act, some physical activity app that does also reward you somehow. Um, you know, and perhaps we need to bring back ad breaks and we shouldn't be able to fast forward them because they were very useful for making sure patients stood up or stretched or made a cup of tea, etc. Um, but I, I agree, I think it's really, really difficult. It's, it's how do you um, change your patients or your person's, people's behaviour into putting as much priority and emphasis on physical activity as they do... Uh, Netflix or, or whatever. I think it's a real, a real conundrum. Can, can I give you my opinion? Um, so I think that um, you're just competing with things that people want to do. And, and actually, inactive people 
want to be active, like all of the insight says, that um, uh, people that are inactive want to be more active. I think you go back to the point about achievable, attainable. There are too many people that have been led to believe through a generational communication overload that physical activity is about things that they can't do, that they're not worthy of, that uh, is above and beyond them, that they don't have the physical competence, capability or fitness to do it, and that's the secret to doing it. They don't, they, they don't want to be, they, they don't want to be a couch potato, they don't want to be physically inactive. The, every single piece of insight out there tells you that those people want to be healthier and they want to be more active. They just don't know how to do it. And the advice that they are very often getting is, is not helpful. So a, a lot of people have spoken today outside and inside about the uh, uh, pain and associated discomfort of certain groups doing physical activity. So they go do it, it hurts because they're fulfilling some perception of what physical activity is supposed to look like and what they think it should feel like. They hate it, they don't do it again. And so reconditioning the programming about what it is and what, where the value is, 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 is absolutely fundamental. You're not going to switch somebody off from an hour, an hour and a half of what you're talking about into an hour, an hour and a half of physical activity, but you just don't need to. And, and actually, well, I slightly disagree that that technology is providing the answer. It's not, you know, again, from what I understand the insight is telling us is that Fitbit and those type of uh, gadgets are engaging people that are already physically active. They're irrelevant to people that are switched off from physical activity. So I, do I think my, my part one words now? Yeah. Let's try it. That it, it, it taps into some deep subconscious visceral emotional drive to go around other people and, and share success. Well, I think it's, it sits around a support mechanism where our communication with you is entirely <coughs> about you can do it, you have a value, and we'll celebrate you doing it, as opposed to the bars up here. And this, <coughs> so, so, you know, we have a very, very specific. Uh, communication strategy about what what we'll share in terms of imagery and, and how we challenge what the rest of the sector and, and there isn't you know we can't hold a specific part of the sector responsible it's just endemic it's across everything it's just become a lazy way of presenting what physical activity is and actually and it, it, we're, it, it is changing, but collectively we've got to understand that you know, 30 seconds worth of physical activity is somebody that isn't doing anything is better than not doing anything at all. And, and we should facilitate that and celebrate it rather than shame and blame and all of the things that, 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 that happen as part of a kind of an, an unsuccessful part. And I think just to add to that, it's worth recognising that actually it's not just over the last five, ten years since you know we've had uh, these access to apps. The decline of physical activity has been over the last 50 years. So it's about those social and cultural changes that we've seen, and we see it if you look at the uh, global data that as uh, in high-income countries it's a common issue, and as income increases in countries they get more inactive. So I think it's about as as the other speakers have, have mentioned, it's about making physical activity relevant, acceptable, and a positive choice for people. Because okay. people are making <coughs> conscious you choices. Get, you, you, just have, you just tell us a solution. Remove disposable income. Well, <laughs> we I'm not sure that was quite we, tough. We were a low income country, we go straight back to having more physical activity. Maybe that's the issue. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure it would be that simple. Or that's something that would be beneficial for that. Any other questions? Anyone else? Um, I won't make a comment as much as anything. Um, Do you want to just put your, and then there should be a button that will turn your microphone on. Fact, yep. Mark Bowditch, I'm here at the of Visual Orthopedic Association, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon and a knee surgeon. Um, that's why I see the very end of the scale with respect to arthritis. Um, but I make a comment first. I first came across a park run in Australia about 25 years ago. It may have been turned something different. But uh, 
um, the, the principle of your competing against yourself was the key that I got out of that, and that was fantastic, and that's what's continued, as against competing against somebody else necessarily. Um, there's a comment about the apps and things. My son keeps sending me something called Sweatcoin, where you, with your activity, you can buy yourself <coughs> gadgets. Um, it seems quite a good thing, so the kids are into that. My problem at my end of the scale with knee arthritis is that they can't do a park run. They can't walk to do exercise because the knee's too painful. So they need to do a, a low impact activity in order to lose weight because with knee arthritis, you can treat it by losing weight. Four times your body weight goes through your knee. Half a stone off is two stone off your knee. It's pretty simple. It doesn't work for hips, but it does work for knees. The difficulty is how do they access and yeah, um, many of us here will be in the economic bracket that you can go swimming, you have got access to an uh, exercise bike, a lot of people don't. They can't or don't have access to pools. Increasingly, the public access to swimming pools is poor. Um, to recommend them to get an exercise bike is, themselves is totally outside their bracket. Access to exercise bikes in communities is difficult. So I think, um, I, I get it about park runs, it's great, but it doesn't help those with lower limb arthritis, be it the ankle, be it the hip, be it the foot, in terms of arthritis. The bit about the physical activity is fantastic and great for those people who haven't got arthritis, particularly of the lower limb, in that particular area. So I think it's down to the Public Health England to influence the policy makers to, in order to make these low impact uh, physical activity um, opportunities much more available to everybody and not just the few. Challenge to public having them. Yeah, I guess that's for me to answer. Um, yeah, so I guess it is about uh, recognising, as you say, what the barriers are, but uh, it, is, it is more complex. Just giving, you know, we de we've seen that just giving free access to swimming pools, for example, isn't, isn't the whole solution. It's about recognising what the barriers are and supporting people to, to overcome those barriers and to become more physically active. And it is also about recognising, as you kind of touched upon, that different things will work for different people. So, uh, you know, swimming is a, gr a great physical activity for, uh, for, for health, but it, you know, it won't necessarily be, be for everyone. So it's about providing people, as I, as I say, making the range of options uh, relevant accessible and, uh, and attractive to people. I think we've probably got time for one more question. Is there another question? Scared everybody up. Yes. <laughs> Too much. They want to get out and stretch. <laughs> oh, there's a question in the back here. Just in terms of education, I've noticed over the years of the access to school playing fields reduced. There seems to be a, has been a cultural shift as well. So what we've got is a growing group of teenagers and adolescents and people in their twenties who just haven't embraced exercise, where their forebears were far more seems to be far more aware of it, despite the lack of technology. <coughs> just wondering what the panel thinks about actually educating people for prevention of some of these conditions or where they can be slowed down as a result of physical activity. Any takers for this one? Um, I guess it's about you know an interesting uh, point about you know how you know does health education work because health education in terms of telling people what's right for them uh, you know hasn't hasn't necessarily been been successful because you know lots of people know what they should be doing but aren't necessarily doing it and I think that's why you know things such as the this girl can and the um, the PhD social marketing campaigns are, to, uh, are starting to, to make some, some traction, uh, get some traction because it's about using insights, about understanding you know, what people's motivations are, what, what the barriers are for people and, uh, and, and presenting uh, physical activity and other health behaviours in that context and something that, they, that rel relates to them, uh, relates to their lives and they can see is accessible and also uh, they actually want to do. I think, uh, so I agree largely with what Mike said there, I think there isn't a single solution to the challenge of inactivity. I think we would all agree 
that education has some part to play, but only if it's supported by resources through the rest of society that feed in and out of it. I think the biggest challenge around the education, education, education solution is we operate in a, um, in a society where there is um, uh, uh, huge imbalances around who successful and who isn't, so, so massive social imbalances which will just be exaggerated by it, driven, but by it being driven through education. So the, the, the population that operate and are least affected by education are the ones that are most suffering from the health challenges and inactivity. So using education as the single solution is only going to impact the populations that are least affected by inactivity, if that makes sense. It, it needs to just fit in to a fully integrated um, uh, package of transformation, I think. Great. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, one of the things that this discussion has illustrated is that physical activity is a complex issue and uh, there isn't one solution. Um, but in this, ra in this room, we have a huge range of people who are all coming at this from a slightly different angle, but all of whom have got a part to play in this. So I want to round off by just asking the panel to briefly say what's the one thing they'd like to see happen to, to make a change. But while the panel are answering that and you're listening to their answers, have a think about what you will do. And I would invite people, if they would like to tweet if you're on Twitter, your answer to what you will do to make a contribution to changing physical activity. Um, so uh, while you're thinking on that, and I might, Michael, to say what's the one thing you think is the most important? Okay, so in terms of, uh, from my perspective and for what I will do, um, I guess on the, as, as I alluded to earlier, I think uh, I'm keen that we, we utilise the, the opportunity that's coming forward in terms of new physical activity guidelines for the, um, for, the, for, for the UK in terms of actually it's not just new guidelines, it's about actually getting an opportunity to, uh, to, to revitalise our approach, to get more people involved in communicating the importance of physical activity and actually... Um, you know, starting to communicate those messages in ways that people, uh, that the public understand, can engage with, and can actually be motivating for them. Great, Claire. Um, so I'm going to promise to have a conversation with every single one of my patients um, about activity, and some of my patients may find that a little strange because I also treat um, patients that have had hand injuries. So. Um, but I think from um, also uh, very much from a NAS point of view and from my patient group ankylosing spondylitis, um, I put a plea out, please, um, for more hydrotherapy pools um, and stop closing them. Thank you. And Nick? I think, without answering your question directly, um, <laughs> what, <laughs> what I would say uh, where I see my focus and our focus is in um, uh, trying to address some of the uh, health inequalities that exist by uh, loading our focus into uh, areas of um, low, low social economic areas um, where the facility opportunity and available physical, availability of physical activity is at its lowest. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, so, in a moment, I'm going to invite those of you who want to carry on debating this. I think Nick has thrown us some great challenges, so you may wish to uh, challenge him back um, or uh, talk about how that might change your thinking. Um, I think there is some wine left, so please do go back to the room we started and continue the discussions if you want. Um, please do keep in touch with us. Uh, as I said, this is an issue that is dear to the hearts of many of our members, and we will be doing more things on this, um, hopefully in, also in partnership with Park Run next year, which we're all deeply excited about. 
or I am anyway, uh, I'm a bit biased, um, but also next week we have a webinar on physical activity and musculoskeletal health, which will go into a little bit more depth about some of the things that uh, have been mentioned here tonight. We, have, we will have a presentation about the moving medicine resource. Um, we will have a presentation about the Love Activity Hate Exercise campaign. Uh, and we will also have one of the Park Run MSK ambassadors talking a bit more about what Park Run does to support people with musculoskeletal conditions to take part. Um, so uh, on your chairs, you should have information about where to find out about that and sign up. Um, so before I thank the speakers, um, I'd just like to say that next year's uh, Armour Lecture will be on another subject which is dear to the heart of many of our members, which is mental health. So look out for that one. Um, and for all the people out there on Twitter, um, the answer is yes, we will have a patient speaker next year. Um, uh, more news on who else might be speaking at a later time. But um, I think this has been a really fascinating and challenging and interesting evening, and I hope you agree. And I'd like you all to thank all of the speakers for their time. Um, thank you all very much for coming.